Okay, welcome everyone to our Fraud Prevention Seminar. I'm so excited to be with you this afternoon and thank all of you for logging in and timely. We are still waiting for one more panelist, so I'm going to go ahead and get started and if we don't, uh, if he doesn't arrive by the time we get to his section, we'll just um, skip on over and go to the next person. So we have a few panelists in the room today as well, and I'll be introducing each one of those separately as we go through our presentation. My name is Mary Lou Turnbull, and I've been with Church Windows for just about 10 years now. In December, it'll be 10 years since I've been with the company. Um, as you can see on the front screen here, the little CCA, that stands for Certified Church Administrator, and that was something that I pursued back when I was a church administrator at my local church in Lexington, Kentucky. So now I'm here in Columbus, Ohio, and that's where we're broadcasting from this afternoon. This um, webinar ha actually serves two purposes for me. Um, one, to touch base with you all, customers and prospects of Church Windows, and deliver some hopefully quality information about fraud. The other purpose is that I am a student at Franklin University and I'm pursuing a forensic accounting degree. And so I'm hoping that maybe this will count for extra points or something like that if my professor gets wind of it. So that would be great if I could uh, count it as both work and school at the same time. The three objectives of our webinar this afternoon are to identify potential exposure to fraud in your church, and hopefully that's why you've joined us, establish some internal controls to reduce that fraud risk, and use technology to assist with reducing your risk. So if we can get those accomplished, we'll be doing great this afternoon. The definition of fraud for churches is slightly amended from the one in the textbook. My definition is the use of one's employment or volunteer position, and that speaks directly to a lot of church personnel, for personal enrichment through the deliberate misuse or misapplication of the organization's resources or assets. So basically what we're talking about here is stealing, taking something, either physical goods or cash, out of the church. That's what we're going to use as our working definition this afternoon. There are four um, common elements under common law that must be present for fraud to exist. They are a material false statement, knowledge that the statement was false when it was uttered, reliance on the false statement by the victim, and damages resulting from the victim's reliance on that false statement. So all of these have to be met in order for fraud to have occurred in your church. The psychology of fraud has to do with some theories that some gentlemen came up with. Um, Sutherland and Cressy came up with the fraud triangle and Albrecht came up with the fraud scale. They're very similar. This is some of the reasons why individuals commit fraud. So you may have wondered what leads people to actually commit the crime. Three uh, situations exist. As you can see in the first one, usually there's situational pressures. Something has happened in their life that they don't feel that they can share with other people. It's called a non-shareable financial problem. Perhaps one spouse has lost a job or something like that. Um, usually starts off with good intentions and that the people are going to pay the money back and then they get in deeper and deeper and they never do. So the second element is perceived opportunity. The thief or fraudster has to have the opportunity to be able to commit the fraud. So if they don't think that anyone is watching, they're much more likely to commit the offense. Rationalization. Once they've started committing the crime, then it's theorized that they rationalize it in some way that, oh, you know, I'm just working at the church, I'm not getting paid enough money, or whatever the situation is, and that somehow, somehow perpetuates their idea that fraud is okay. There's kind of a uniqueness to church fraud, and 
One of the new terms that was just developed uh, since the year 2000 is affinity fraud. It's fraud among people that share a common bond. So definitely churches fit into that category. It's based on religion, ethnicity, or professions. So lots of different types of groups can participate in this kind of fraud. Usually someone comes into the organization, usually from the outside, and then they try to pass themselves off as one of them, one of those people. And so a lot of churches have been taken by with fraudulent, mostly investment frauds, and security regulators are really watching this and um, alarmed at the increase in this type of fraud. So it's just something to keep your eye on if you're involved, one in your local church or you know sitting on a board of a church. The next slide talks about the different types of fraud that we have. Um, we can break it down into five or six types. We're going to be hearing stories about each of these types, and that's the exciting part of the presentation. The first one, skimming and cash larceny, um, our friend James is going to speak about this afternoon. Some of the other ones that I have listed, check tampering, billing schemes, payroll schemes, and expense reimbursements. So you may be familiar with some of those. Sometimes the name speaks for itself, but we're going to also go through some of the definitions of these different types of fraud. Fraudulent disbursements is actually the most common method employees use to steal cash from an organization. And basically it would be billing schemes and payroll schemes, expense reimbursements. Those are usually the ones that constitute fraudulent disbursements, although any of these four really could be in that category. If we go into some definitions, you can see that skimming is the theft of cash before it's entered into the books. So a good example of this might be um, if you've ever thought about going through the McDonald's drive through and you always notice that they give you a receipt with your, with your order. Um, in fact, lots of times when you go into a store or a retail establishment, you'll see a little sign that says if they don't give you a receipt, your food is free or something like that. And that's really an internal control by the organization to make sure that the employee is entering that cash into the books or basically entering it into the register. So we've come a long way in this regard. I know there's a lot of surveillance cameras, et cetera, that are on employees when they're working the cash registers. But skimming is basically taking it straight from the customer or wherever out of the envelope in the mail and putting it in your pocket. So it's before it gets entered into the books. And that's what distinguishes it from larceny, which is defined here as the taking or carrying away of money or property of another person without the consent of the owner and with the intent to deprive the owner of its use or possession. So you can see that it's not okay to borrow some things and keep them in your garage forever. So that's basically larceny. Cash larceny at the bottom is the theft of money after it has been entered into the books. So a scenario here would be something like perhaps the counters have done their thing on a Sunday morning or Sunday afternoon after church and the information has been entered into church windows or whatever, the person goes happily off to the bank, but unfortunately not all of the money makes it into the bank. So that's where we have the larceny happening, and it never really meets up with the bank deposit, and if no one's checking to make sure that the deposit ticket equals what the books say, then people get away with larceny. So this is just some of the, the ways that people take money. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and introduce James Wilson this afternoon. He is a detective with the Columbus Division of Police in the Economic Crime Unit. He's been there for 10 years and he's been with the police department for 22 years. So I'm just thrilled that he is able to be with us today. He's talking about some cases that he's worked on. So this is our real life person, just like on Law and & Order, and uh, if you didn't hear that, that they're going off the air, I'm very sorry about that. That's one of my favorite shows. So um, you can see here by the slide, he investigates church fraud, and he's also a part-time faculty at Franklin University, which is where I happen to be attending. So 
I'm so appreciative of him being with us today. Thanks for taking time out, James. There you go. James, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you now. Oh, thank you. Okay, go right ahead. Okay, I have uh, investigated two major church cases, uh, one being roughly $1 million involving a pastor or church administrator and uh, secretary, which is, happened to be his wife, another being a, a local pastor in central Ohio who uh, actually embezzled more than $250,000. Uh, most of the key problems with this case are their lack of internal controls uh, were primarily in the trust factor. Uh, too much trust was given to one individual to oversee uh, quite a few areas of financial concern in the uh, church environments. Um, audits were often not done in these situations because the pastor had total control and he uh, opted not to have them done in this situation. This case is, uh, I, can, I can speak of as World of Pentecost Church, it's uh, active still, it's due to go to trial, it's been a year delay in the trial based on a few different appeals and 32 counts of uh, felony theft and money laundering and forgery. Um, let's see what else we can touch on in this case. It was so many different factors in the case. Uh, it originated out of a property sale to the city of Columbus for roughly $980,000. And at that point, the uh, pastor made himself a signer on the accounts, which it's done quite often in a lot of churches. I don't know if it's a good practice because the controls can be uh, through intimidation. Yes, so in this you. case, the uh, pastor chose to become a signer on the account so that he would have access to these funds. Um, before the sale took place, he was not a signer on the account. And in this case, he made his brother-in-law brother uh, the church administrator so that he could manipulate the funds, although the brother-in-law did not have any financial experience in order to control um, the ingoing or the outgoing flow of the uh, cash from the bank accounts. Wow, that is amazing. Doesn't have any experience, but yet comes in and works in the right, church. Right, he was able to appoint him based on being a pastor of the church. Um, we can go on through this case. There were conversion of property. The church had mortgages, mortgages against the church that he was able to do without the consent of a board uh, due to he was able to forge uh, a vote that it was okay for him to go forward with that. And the meetings didn't reflect that. No one really knew that this had taken place until after three loans had been taken against the church and were repaid by the church unknowingly. That and, just blows me away. <laughs> and uh, How big of a church was this, James? Uh, this church had approximately 80 members. Oh. Not a real large church. The sale no. of the property was primarily how they uh, uh, achieved these funds and were looking forward to building a new church. So, and I could go on. There's credit cards. There's personal purchases. There's a, a, a conversion of property. And salary was astronomical for his um the size of his congregation, mm -hmm. and just numerous uh, lax internal controls because he was the internal control in this situation, which was uh, not effective as far as uh, keeping the funds within the church. The other cases involving another church is very similar as far as this, the control factor of um, no accountability. There's no one that the pastor had to account for in this situation. Um, the administrators were undertrained and no, not accounting persons in order to be able to reconcile and control uh, the accounts effectively. So they were pretty much tokens in this situation and also ended up facing criminal charges because they weren't fiduciary responsible for the accounts. So pretty much uh, they kind of border the same pattern. So if anyone has any questions, uh, you can bring them forward to me. Uh, I'll answer as many as I can. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, he, he touched on um, quite a few of these different terms. Um, I asked him to speak mostly on skimming and cash larceny. I'm not sure if you were here for that part of the presentation when we defined those areas. But okay. um, you mentioned conversion. And like I asked you earlier, I'm sure some of our audience doesn't understand what conversion is. Could you explain that a little more? 
and converse, conversion can start out as just like the church. The church belong belonged to um, World's World of Pentecost was completely paid for, yet he was able to convert uh, the use of that for his own personal gain as far as uh, loans, uh, vehicle purchases, uh, in-ground pool in his backyard, as wow. well as golf, golf lessons and so forth. <laughs> it was total, total abuse. Terrible. And when you mm -hmm. convert uh, business property for personal gain, it starts out as a conversion, and then you will tie a theft charge onto that. Helps a lot. I wasn't sure what that term actually meant. Okay. Um, did you have other cases you wanted to talk about? Um, I, do. I can run through. I'm looking at the screen. I can run through um, each of these categories. That, that would be great. To the church. Okay. In the forgery, uh, primarily what we went after was the, the meetings of the church as far as uh, that the meeting occurred and that the uh, I would say the executive board signed off that it was okay for him to go forward and produce these loans, which were forgeries, and that helped us tremendously in putting together a case against him as far as uh, knowing that the congregation didn't agree to what he was doing. Skimming, it kind of spoke of before, to whereas it can be, skimming can happen on many facets, even in your uh, offerings as far as uh, they're not recorded or, or recorded improperly. Cash Larson, kind of mentioned in this that he had just total freedom. If you if you don't have any checks and balances, cash larceny can occur relatively easily. The money laundering portion of this is a term where if you take a bad situation as far as uh, stolen funds and you attempt to make them good is where the term money laundering comes in at. In this case, the loans were fraudulent, and when he took those loans and attempted to make purchases, he would divert some, saying they were for church, for church purposes, some personal. We were able to make lo money laundering charges off of that because they were obtained fraudulent, fraudulently. So that go through those four. Thank you. Yes, that's helpful. We do have a question. Um, did the congregation not receive any reports showing the paying back of the loans that he took out? The church was unaware of the loans that had taken place. One was uh, a Hummer. Uh, they knew he had this Hummer, but they didn't know they were paying for it. And uh, they had no nice idea vehicle. that there was a loan in that place, a loan in place against the church. They thought it was a personal loan on his behalf. And then we had another question. Um, do you have any other stories about employees? Pick a category. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe volunteers. Um, since you know they don't have to be employed, it couldn't. They could be a volunteer, and any anybody okay, that's ripped a off the church. Mm -hmm. That uh, well, I can stay with the, even the church case. In this case, the uh, the church administrator started out as a volunteer, and then roughly, in order to uh, to gain his uh, trust, he was paid a hundred dollars a month while this uh, pastor in this situation was pulling in a, almost 25000 a month from his uh, salary and expenses that were, I, was, I should say, stolen, not expenses. But in this situation, we had to charge the church administrator as well for his role as far as being a signer on the account. Even though he pre-signed the majority of the checks, it still made him uh, responsible for those checks, even as a very underpaid church administrator based on some of the things that he had to do. Right. Those church administrators, I tell you, they get a bad rap sometimes. <laughs> um, I do have two other questions from the floor. Did okay. the church have a financial committee? A financial committee. They had a, um, they had an executive board, which he was a member of, and he controlled the paperwork as far as what he allowed them to see. He would produce the documents and they would just verify the document without any supporting documents like a bank statement that says, yes, these funds are in the bank. So it was pretty much a fully trusting their pastor that he was doing the right thing. Wow. We're getting a lot of wows on the questions here, too. And someone's asking how long before the fraud was discovered. Uh, it took over a year, about a year and a half, for the fraud to be discovered. He was able to avoid that by putting together... Um, building fund reports that show the money was still in the account. 
that suffice for a period of time until the ch congregation kind of grew tired and ready to move on to a bigger church or remodel the one they had in existence. Very good. Thanks. Can you speak to the fiduciary responsibility of anyone taking the job of a church administrator? Um, speaking as a former church administrator, I know that there is a distinction between signing authority and simply, you know, doing the books kind of thing. In my uh, investigation of churches, it's a very difficult situation because as a pastor, you want to be able to lead your church and lead the direction. You want to have some say and some input, and I've heard that argument uh, at the same time to whereas if they become a signer on a certain account, they, they feel like they have more access, more control more, as far as the direction of the church, but also it puts the, uh, the administrator in a in a bad situation as far as maybe possibly succumbing to that pastor's wants and desires or needs as being the technically the CEO of the church. So in some situations you see them as an employee, which I think works better for the church administrator because they have a little more leverage, a little more control. But if they're operating as church administrator and the pastor is operating pretty much as CEO, yes. it, it can create quite a bit of conflict. Exactly. Wow. So, in the end, though, I mean, you have to be responsible for what it goes out of the account, what comes in, so, or you could be criminally charged. So you would have to uh, hold your ground, basically, in a situation where your control is being undermined in some capacity. Right. Excellent. Thank you so much for that. I don't think we have any more questions, so you're welcome to stay on with us. We appreciate you taking time out of your day, especially just with all of your experience working, and keep, keep doing that out there. <laughs> if you had um, maybe top two things for people to take away in terms of prevention, what would you say they should do at their church? Prevention, um, checks and balances are, are critical. I mean, a lot, of, a lot of people would think that if it's a person who signs off on, on your work or overlook what you're doing, or if there's two signers that it's nitpicking, uh, they can even say that it's it's cumbersome, but it's necessary. It's very necessary in order to uh, achieve the financial results that you want. It helps with growth. I've seen a lot of churches suffer through this, uh, through having limited financial experience. So if you have someone who's uh, an accountant or capable of operating that capacity because they've been trained or educated in that capacity, definitely utilize their talents and you can't rely on a person to have too much control to do everything. They, exactly. It, separate, it has to be separation of duties if you want to succeed mm -hmm. without in, incurring some kind of internal thefts. That's one thing. Uh, the last thing would be is to make sure that you decide to be responsible and decide to have integrity in your position prior to the event coming to surface. It will be too late to decide once it's occurring you'll find yourself in a bad situation if you decide later that I'm going to do the right thing now. You have to decide that you're going to do the right thing before it occurs. Great. And that would be probably the two main things. And you can't read very much fraud literature without finding those two examples throughout a lot of the, a lot of the cases that we read. So that's great. Excellent. Thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, no problem. I wish I had... Uh, uh, this case has been probably pending for it's been pending for a year and a half, so I haven't really dug through it too much. It's been moving on to other cases, which mm -hmm. I've plenty of. But uh, hopefully, I share this. And like I said, it's World of Pentecost. It's public record. If anyone wants to re, uh, research it and get more information on it, uh, there's a 32 count indictment against this pastor. Wow! It should come to trial here in the next couple of months, according to the prosecutor. Well, we'll watch the press for that and. Um so just keep up the good work out there, and uh, maybe I'll run into you somewhere in my classes at Franklin. Okay. Thank you Thanks for having Thanks a lot. Me. All right. Okay. I'm going to move on, and we have another panelist with us this afternoon. This is Mary Lee, and I think she comes to us from Mississippi. You can correct me if I'm wrong, Mary Lee. Mary Lee is one of our customers, and um, she has some stories for us this afternoon. Okay. Thanks, Mary Lee. Um, the first experience, um, this was a, when I was working as a CPA, um, we got a call on a Sunday night actually from a physician who had a bookkeeper that he trusted very much with his um, business, and which was audited regularly, um, reviewed on a monthly basis. 
um, but he also gave her access to his personal information. She would run errands for him, uh, write personal checks for his utilities, everything else, and she had his credit card. Um, he signed the checks to pay this credit card every month, but was not very careful to look at the detail behind them. Just trusted her that it was all correct. Well, one, this Sunday, he happened to look at the detail and noticed that there were cash advances charged to his credit card. Um, and he knew that he was not responsible for those. So they called us in the next morning, had us go through the records, found out that she had taken nearly $39,000 in cash advances over a period of time from him. She had never intended to let the debt grow to that amount. She had intended to pay it back. Her husband had a drug abuse problem and had asked her to help him get a fix here and there so she would borrow the money. Um, as it snowballed, it became impossible for her to pay it all back. Uh, the physician did not choose to press charges because her father stepped in and repaid all of the money. Came to find out, someone finally picked up the phone and called her prior employer that she had done the same thing there. The father had bailed her out also and they had not pressed charges. So you could run a criminal background check on her and she appeared fine. They had not done a good job checking references on her before they hired her. Oh, um, it's just so amazing. Sorry to stop you right there, but um, that just happens so many times in churches. You know, they don't do any kind of checking and pay the price, unfortunately. Well, I think in the church environment, it's that you were talking about the affinity fraud. That's the perfect example. Everybody comes in talking about being a Christian and their faith journey, and it's hard to believe they're capable of something like that. So you're right. You're at, at great risk. True, um, true. The yeah. second... The second um, experience was in the church where I presently serve as financial secretary and was a member many years before that. We hired an outside janitorial service and we had a man that would come in and open things up in the morning and he stayed till around noon and someone else would come in in the afternoon to clean up after the preschool and Mother's Day Out programs, that sort of thing. And he had been working for us for several years and all of a sudden things began to come up missing. We had a laptop in our coffee shop that turned up missing. Uh, somebody called several weeks later and had bought it from the Salvation Army thrift shop, and, but it kept coming to our web page, so they called and said, hey, are you missing the laptop? We were able to get it back, but the small change in the coffee shop would disappear. Um, and finally, um, the contributions one Sunday when the girl came in on Monday, this was before I began to work here, um, came in on Monday morning and the Sunday contributions that, that were locked up in a fireproof file cabinet were gone. Uh, someone did find where the checks had been dumped in the dumpster, but the cash, of course, was gone. Mm -hmm. um, and a couple of weeks prior to that, the church secretary's keys that had the keys to the closet and the locked safe had been lost, but they were found and nobody thought anything of it. We went, got on past that, recovered the checks as best we could and just wrote the cash off as a loss. Well, it happened again. And that time somebody said, you know, this, this sound, is sounding more and more like an inside job and we set up a surveillance system, had four cameras installed at doors and on this particular closet that the money's oh, locked in. Very smart, very out. smart turned out to be the fellow from the janitorial service, which was a bonded service, um, but it was still, you know, he saw the opportunity of the keys there. That's also a situation where he had a situation in his family changed. His brother with health problems had come to live with him, and I am sure he saw opportunity and knew they were a very low-income family, that that could be of help to them. I'm sure he rationalized it in his own mind um, that it was okay to take that money. Uh, the last story is, um, this is a treasurer, volunteer treasurer for a school PTO group. She served for two years, um, and along the way there had been grumblings about, shouldn't we have more money than this? But nobody had really looked into it, and they had asked me to serve the next year as treasurer. So I, she gave me a copy of the financial statements as of the date she was handing it over to me, and that was it. And I said, do you not have your financial records and bank statements from the prior years? And she hemmed and hawed and put me off and got to where she wouldn't take my phone calls or anything else. And then finally one day I left a message saying, please bring me something or I'll need to make, you know, contact some other folks. Well, she eventually brought me her records. 
uh, spreadsheets, that sort of thing, but she would not bring me bank statements. And I had to call the bank to get bank statements, and it became apparent very quickly what she had been doing and why there was no money in the PTA <laughs> account. Um, she was taking cash from the fundraisers. She would write checks to cash, sometimes as much as $2,500 a pop, and record them as written to someone else, or she would take a legitimate check, maybe reimbursing a teacher for supplies for $150, she would record it as $350. Um, and no one was following. She was also reconciling the bank statement. She was the only person collecting the cash and the money at the fundraisers and making the deposits. Nobody was reviewing the financial statements, and nobody was comparing it to prior year or to the budget. So there were, I mean, she just had total control. And at one point in a meeting, somebody suggested doing an audit. And her re response was, now, why would you want to do that? Oh, <laughs> Which yeah. Which hindsight, no they should have, jumped right on. <laughs> should have jumped right on it. Um, but we uh, compared all the checks um, and eventually found she had taken nearly $29,000. Wow. Uh, my recommendation, if you ever come upon something like this, is um, we debated where we didn't have very much money, we're a not-for-profit, it's a school organization, whether to hire an attorney or not. At first we decided, no, the district attorney is our friend, he will take care of this. Um, somebody's spouse stepped up and said, I'm an attorney, and if you'll pay me a very small retainer, I'll help walk you through oh, this. Oh, excellent. We were very glad that we did that because the DA's office was very happy to um, settle for no jail time and for her to pay this $29,000 back over five years at $500 a month or thereabouts. And she, her husband was unemployed and she was uh, like an assistant school teacher or something. Mm -hmm. And we were not, the PTA was pretty angry about it because she had been living above her means. We had seen her take a trip to Disney World and buy a new car, knowing mm -hmm. that her husband's unemployed and she does not have yeah. a very high and paying job. But um, we said, no, we'd like for there to be jail time. This is not a satisfactory event. And of course, the minute we started to push the jail time, she came up with the $29,000, which we were able to have access to for the next school year. Oh, amazing how she could just yeah. come up with that money, isn't it? Very interesting. Oh, those are excellent stories, and they point to so many lessons that we can learn from our different situations that happen to us. And I think that's why a lot of people have joined us today in our webinar is how can we prevent this from happening in our church? So just stay on the line there for a minute. We're going to go through these lessons learned. Obviously, the first one, background checks and references. And that is just another reason to prosecute. I mean, sometimes if somebody doesn't have a criminal record because churches do not pursue any kind of paying for the penalty, they just forgive and forget, then you have a, a bad situation. So for future employees or future volunteers at churches. So lots of times they are trusted employees or volunteers. Uh, the situation with the safe, I remember thinking, that lots of times churches get into a routine where, you know, same the counters do it every Sunday afternoon and somebody could be watching from the outside and see that pattern and very quickly pick up on the church's routine. So that is something that you could probably change up once in a while. I know that's hard for some churches. We've always done it this way. We hear that all the time. Yeah, just consider changing your routine and throwing the thieves off so that they can't get their hands on your money. In terms uh, Mary of, Lou, yeah, go ahead. Um, what we did also in that case is um, have the money counters actually make a night deposit on Sunday, so that that money is not even kept at the church anymore. Right. That's a great. That's a great idea. That's the way we used to do it at our church. It was called unworked. You could actually take it to the bank. The bank wouldn't process it, and then in the morning someone would drive by. Of course, it would be locked in one of those bags. And then we could take it to the church and count it and enter it right into the system. So that prevented some, yeah, that provided some internal controls, I should say. Excellent. Mm -hmm. That was, that was, those were great stories. Does anybody else have any questions? Um, I see, it's really funny, we have a couple of Mary Lees as customers. And Mary Lee, I don't know how to pronounce your last name, Dungan. 
Dugan um, is saying, what, another Mary Lee when I introduce you. So it's kind of funny. Um, it's kind of a name like Mary Lou, so there's not too many of us around. In answer to the question from James's, um, the name of the church was actually World Pentecost. And one of our other attendees looked that up on the internet while we were talking, and she said it came up right away about the pastor under indictment. So interesting stuff, and uh, we appreciate very much your stories. Thank you for participating. Is there anything else that you'd like to add, Mary Lee? Uh, thank you. Covered it well. Thank you for having me. Oh, great. It was a pleasure. Okay, next up is one of uh, my coworkers. Her name is Carolyn, and she's one of the technicians with us here at Church Windows. Perhaps you've called in and asked some accounting questions, and Carolyn is one of our experts in that area. And she has some stories from customers. Actually, not a good thing in some ways, but she did find out some information for us to help us out today. So can you hear us okay? Yes, I can. Great. You're loud you and doing? clear. Okay. Um, I've been with the company for about 10 years, and we do occasionally hear stories about you know, people taking advantage of the church, and um, it always saddens us when we hear that, because it is, it's so hard on the, the churches to try to make up the loss. This particular church, this has happened in one church, and it really stood out. It was really awful. The person had total responsibility for every aspect of church management. She did the contributions, the financial, the payroll. She did the banking, the deposit, the check signing, the reconciliation, literally everything they trusted her with. And this was over the course of seven years. And the theft involved all of the modules. She used to keep all the loose offering for contributions. Church Windows has a feature where you can transfer the contributions directly into financial. And this way you have an audit trail. You can double check what you've done in contributions to what you've posted into financial. She decided not to use that. She went in and manually then entered the contributions through posting income into financial and used different dates so that when they ultimately tried to go back and check it out, they had a really hard time matching things up. In the financial area, she wrote initially a lot of manual checks. She wrote them to legitimate vendors, legitimate payees, but the checks were written out to herself. Uh, when she had to go to computer checks, she would write the checks, do the transactions to herself. Then she would reverse them and repost them in as legitimate vendor postings. When she had to transfer money from checking to savings or back and forth, she wrote the money to her check, to herself. To find out what happened, the church ultimately had to get check copies from the bank to try to backtrack. Um, she did the bank reconciliations all manually, not in the system. When they went to look, nothing was marked as cleared. They had no reference point where to start. They couldn't tell what had happened, if everything had been logged in correctly. It was really hard to backtrack what she did um, because she did not have, she did not use the bank reconciliation in the system to verify, and no one was double checking her. Uh, the most interesting one I thought was in payroll. Uh, she went ahead and um, did all the payroll correctly. Um, she filed all the 941s, did all the W-2s, sent out the W-3s. Then at the end of the year, she went back into the prior year and issued additional checks for herself as several other employees and herself as manual checks oh, and didn't transfer so them over. Oh, that is so appalling. I've just got to stop you right there. Um, that is totally unbelievable. So actually moved the year back and wrote checks to herself. Right, uh, and okay. there was real interesting is the only way they could discover it was accidentally. An employee had lost his W-2, and they had to go back into the prior year to find, you know, to reprint him another one. And that's when he looked at this, his line one and said, you know, this isn't right, this isn't what I made. And that's when they started double-checking payroll. When she realized they were kind of, you know, getting on to her, she left on the spur of the moment. She took all the program CDs, all the paper records, the backup of the data. She uninstalled the program. What she didn't know was that the pastor had done a backup of the complete system on his own and had it. So we sent them replacement CDs, and they figured out over the course of the seven years um, they had lost about $150,000, and they did prosecute her. Very good. Oh, my. That is quite the story. And it was all one person. All one person, all one church. Yep. Yeah. Just, Just no, to, no double checks. Right. Goes to the whole checks and balances issue. There should not be one person that's doing it from start to finish. 
We've heard this over and over again. But yay for the backup for the pastor. <laughs> yes. Pastor comes out good on this one. It's nice to hear a story. <laughs> We're trying not to slam pastors or church administrators like I used to be. Um, but, yeah, yeah. It's, it's really terrible. Thank you so much for sharing that story. Um, yeah, the rule of thumb for that is you can't have enough backups. <laughs> Very true, very true, great. Okay, I'm just going to go on here. You can stay on the line for just a second. I'm going to go through some of the screens that Carolyn was talking about. Since this is a church windows presentation, we would be remiss in not showing you some screens. So this is the one that Carolyn was speaking about that takes contributions from the um, contribution side over into accounting. This is the new accounting screen. She mentioned the word financial several times, and that was our old program. Some people still using financial, but um, accounting is the new rewritten module, and we have some additional safeguards, I think, in place now in accounting that are really great. So, so the next screen, so this shows actually, you know, the contribution accounts, what was given to, and then over here in the fours and and ones, the assets and the income accounts, what which accounts were posted to. So this acts as a check and balance to make sure that what people gave, the contribution credit, is the same amount that went into the bank. So anyone looking at the deposit tickets should be able to identify whether all the money is there. In this case, it's just $750 in our little example. The next screen I want to show is the new audit trail um, in our browse transaction screen so you can see all the activity that was conducted and the different types contribution bills and payments and then over here there's a column for date posted and the time and then user and that's by login so our new login actually asks you to identify a person in this case I think you can see I try to use my little drawing tool here but you can see here Bob and Sally right down here on this column so you can see that they used the system and when they used it, which is really helpful, and then also um, the time and what types of transactions that they conducted. So, you know, if, if Bob's not supposed to be in the contributions and he's in there, you can tell a lot from looking at the browse transaction report or the, the screen in your church windows. And I just mentioned bank reconciliations as well. It's essential that they're being done in the system. Many of the technicians receive calls all the time and people say they're out on their bank reconciliation. And so we start to help them or we say, you know, pull up the bank reconciliation and people say, oh, I'm not doing it on the system. And it's like, well, how can you be sure that your books are correct if you're not using our bank reconciliation? So sometimes some really enlightening things come out about that. As far as lessons learned here, what Carolyn was relating in her stories, I think we can all see how technology can help us with our checks and balances. You can use the system the way it was intended, which is that the contributions would equal the amount going into the bank, plus any you know, enter income, any additional income like rentals and such that you would enter. The division of responsibilities, that is just key. And we have heard this over and over um, from James earlier and Mary Lee as well. Um, you One person can't be doing it all or you're just asking for trouble, basically. And your internal controls, again, I think if there's something that you're going to come out of here with, it's going to be the internal controls. So is there anything else that you have, Carolyn, that you want to add? Nope, that's it. Okay, thanks so much. Thanks for yep. taking time out of support calls. I know that sure. really breaks your heart. <laughs> yes, it does. <laughs> okay, talk to Thank you, later. you everyone. Thank Bye. You. Okay. Okay, like any good presentation, sometimes there's pop quizzes. So what I'm going to do is ask you a question, and you all can log in on your keyboards and make one of the choices here. I'm going to launch our poll. My poll says, which of the following is not a legal element of fraud? And I've got 60% voting. Looks like we've got 72 now. And let's see if we can show you... And the correct answer is D, all of the above are legal elements of fraud. And just about everyone chose that. So a material false statement, that's basically lying. So you're, you're making up something. And, and we're going to go on and move on to Maureen. Maureen, can you hear me OK? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thanks. OK. Um, I'd just like to share a story that 
uh, of something that I experienced at my own church this past winter. We have three fundraisers at our church. In November, we have a craft fair. In January, we have a spaghetti dinner. And in February, we have a yard sale. And my husband and I are in charge of the craft fair. And when it's finished, Saturday at like 2 o'clock, my husband and I, the president of the church council, and two other gentlemen went into the back room, and we counted all the cash. We had a, a, um, a tally sheet, so we had exactly how much money came in and so forth. So there were quite a few of us in the room when that was done. I noticed, however, at the spaghetti dinner, when the spaghetti, spaghetti I can't say spaghetti today, spaghetti dinner was finished, um, our two co-chairs, who happened to be husband and wife, took the cash and the checks and so forth, went into the back room, and proceeded to count the money. And several of us walked past the door and basically said, um, would you like some help? We know we'll help you. Oh, no, 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 we're doing it. And we let it go. And later, several of us were saying, you know, that's not a very good idea. Not that we would ever mistrust these two, but from what we've heard today, of course, that can happen. So basically, we started looking into our policies and procedures as to how it should happen. Because for one thing, we wanted to protect them. We didn't want them to be under suspicion that they might stick any of that money in their pockets. I, I believe I know why they wanted to do it. Because on Sunday morning after we have a, a fundraiser, there's always an announcement during an announcement time. And it's always, drum roll, how much money did we make in the spaghetti dinner? And it's always a big surprise. So right, I think right. they basically didn't want to ruin the surprise. But it has caused us to kind of rethink how these things are done. And the more I thought about it, I realized that I probably wasn't doing things well either. Because during the craft show, we would set up Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday for the craft fair. And throughout that week, members were allowed to come in and buy something early. And somebody would come in and say, I'd like to buy these two pictures. Here's $20. And they would hand it to me. And I would put it in my little envelope and put it away. Well, there really wasn't any accounting for that money that I took in ahead of time. So there again, I rethought myself, how should I have done it better? And I'd like some, maybe some suggestions from you, Mary Lou, or from somebody else about what's a good way to protect myself? Because somebody could have said, well, you know, she took that money and took it home. It's hers. Um, so I kind of wouldn't mind some suggestions here. Excellent. That's great. And I neglected to introduce you. I'm so sorry. I was so busy <laughs> trying to manage my poll, and I haven't done That's that okay. before. So um, I don't even know if everybody got to see the results on the screen. Did oh, you yes, we did. I did. did. <laughs> okay, good. Um, and so I forgot to introduce Maureen is one of the principals in the company. And how long have you been with Church Windows, Maureen? Mm -hmm, 1986. Wow. Just about since the beginning of the company, right? Since the beginning, yes. Yes. Well, we're Glad to have you, and glad to have you relate mm -hmm. your real-life stories. It's much yes. more interesting, <laughs> I think, for people when they can relate to mm -hmm. what happens in a church. Um, some of you may have other ideas. You can just type them in there. Um, I am getting something from Chuck. Thank you so much, Chuck, for sending me the reminder about Richard Hammer. One of the people that I often refer people to when they have questions like this is an individual that's involved with NACBA. That's the National Association of Church Business Administrators, and of which I'm a member. And Richard Hammer is an attorney and a CPA. And he produces, I believe it's called Church and Clergy Tax Guide. Not easy to say, but um, that comes out, I'm not sure how often, um, maybe once a year. And that answers a lot of questions on financial matters. And being both an attorney and a CPA, he can speak to a lot of the issues that we face. And he does weigh in on a lot of these kinds of questions. I think the main thing here is to have more than one person verifying the cash that you receive. So perhaps a system of having a register where somebody, you know, signs that they purchased, you know, whatever they purchased at your garage sale or rummage sale and, you know, they, they bought a coat for $10 or whatever they purchased, something to verify how much cash that you should have so that you mm -hmm. can prove basically how much cash you should have received. Right. And I see, a, I see a good suggestion from Mary Lee here. She suggested that I write 
a cash receipt for any cash that I received and the buyer keeps a copy and I have a carbon and that way when somebody hands me that twenty dollars I just scratch out you know twenty dollars here here's your copy I have a copy and I really like that idea because that means there's paper on both sides I, li I like that idea as well thanks Mary mm -hmm. Mary Lee for that um, recommendation and it's not hard to do remember in the old days that's the way we used to do everything cash receipts <laughs> we used to write it down on the carbon and but it still has mm -hmm. a purpose and uh, mm -hmm. sometimes I think even in the church office when we receive money in there should be one of those little books that you give to the individual that gave you the cash whether it's for reimbursement of Sunday school materials or paying for a retreat or something like that a lot of that kind of money is cash and it can go missing mm -hmm. really easily with mm -hmm. no checks and balances so Excellent, excellent story. I'm just going to move mm -hmm. on on our lessons learned here. And I have one. I have one more thing here, sure. um, Mary Lou. Um, oh, Carolyn is just suggesting if you have a master list of items with a column of amount charged and place pay, pay, place the check paid, like in the school fundraiser. So you you actually have a ledger. Then here's the item, here's the check, and here's how much was paid for it. So it's sort of the same idea of getting it in writing. And we do have another uh, comment from one of the participants. It says, it's our church policy to not allow family members to count the money together. <laughs> so <laughs> I think we all That's agree. a good idea. <laughs> that is a really good idea. So mm -hmm. two people in the back, or even worse, oh, yes, our married couple takes the money home and counts it. Hmm. <laughs> a lot of privacy there. So uh, <laughs> okay. yeah, kind of a potential waiting to happen. Yes. Great. Well, thanks so much for telling your story. Um, You're welcome. One of the lessons learned here, um, we've got often the embezzlers are trusted long-term employees or volunteers, and that is often the case in churches. We have the affinity fraud thing going on where people trust each other because they've known them or they've known their their family has been in the church for years, and so often this is an excuse for overlooking, you know, doing background checks and that kind of thing that we've talked about earlier with some of our stories. Oftentimes we find that the fraud starts with a small amount with the full intention of paying the money back. And the reason for the crime is very honorable, like Mary Lee mentioned in her stories as well. You have a sick child or the spouse lost their job, somebody was in an accident and you need a lot of medical funds. And again, back to the theories of fraud, you know, when you have something a financial situation, perhaps a spouse does lose a job and you're too embarrassed to share it with the church community, which should be the first place that you would feel welcome to share, but unfortunately sometimes people don't and they just want to, you know, get the money somehow and they, they really can't tell anybody about it and so that's part of the reason why they embezzle. So it's often really too bad that that happens. Any other questions from the floor at this point? of all of our stories that we've gone over. Okay, while you're doing that, I'm going to try the poll again. This next one is the most common method that employees use um, to steal or to commit fraud. Got quite a few of you voting, so this is fun. Looks like skimming is taking the lead here. 30% have fraudulently. Okay, we've got mostly everybody has voted. There we go, sharing the poll results. Okay, so it looks like the majority of you said skimming money before it was entered into the books, and second was fraudulently billing for goods or services. The right answer is fraudulently billing. I think this is taken more from a corporate perspective, and one of the other girls and I were speaking about this and this particular question, and it's kind of misleading. In churches, I think we have a little bit of a different scenario, and I would probably argue more that skimming, taking the money straight away before it's entered into the books is, is probably the way, the majority of the way that people get cash in religious organizations, nonprofits, and churches. Um, but the real reason, the real answer, the true answer according to the experts is fraudulently billing. And I think it's probably to do with the, the dollar amount that you actually gain as well. So that could be part of it. But we're going to go ahead and move on here and talk about what do you do when you actually find a thief or someone that you think is committing fraud. Okay, so the first one is the person is denying it. And 
sometimes we're reluctant because they're members of the congregation to actually get right in their face and, and ask them about it. If you would feel more comfortable, you could turn over the investigation to a CPA firm. I don't think anyone would question that you were having somebody, an objective party, to come in and look at the books. Like Mary Lee's example, though, sometimes it is expensive, and especially to conduct a full-fledged audit. Maybe you want a review, which is usually involves some looking over your procedures and making sure that you have certain things in place. Um, certified Fraud Examiner, which is what I'm hoping to achieve a couple of years from now after I finish my forensic accounting. Or you could call the police. So that's where our friend James Wilson gets involved. And sometimes just even the threat of doing that causes the person to, you know, immediately crumble and just say, okay, yeah, I did it or I've been doing something wrong. The next point, um, if the embe embezzler confesses, be cautious before you forgive and forget. And we did speak about that in some of the stories where because you're the church and because that person is part of the congregation, you might be tending more to just say, okay, just pay the money back and we're not going to file charges. And that's why I was so interested in, in Mary Lee's scenario because if that happens, you are really doing a disservice to another church who may employ that person or just the fact that nothing goes on their criminal record. And if we're going to be doing background checks and such, we want to make sure that fraud is reported. So that's one of the things that don't be too anxious to just forgive and forget. So you want to make sure that you uh, report that and that at least the perpetrator is, is punished uh, at least enough that it's going to be, there's going to be a record of that. Okay, let's just move on. Potential clues to fraudsters. This is one of my favorite things that we learned when we were studying in my fraud class and some of the stories touched on it too. A sudden affluent lifestyle. All of a sudden, somebody's driving around in a Porsche or Lamborghini or something that they otherwise couldn't afford, and you wonder how they got the money. I think that was in one of Mary Lee's stories as well, that the husband was sick, and so nobody could figure out how this person could go on these fancy vacations. So that is sometimes a clue. You'd think that it would be just the opposite. You'd think if someone stole money that they'd want to hide it. Uh, at least that would be my tendency, but um, I'm not sure. Well, maybe I don't have the fraudster mind. I hope not. Uh, anyway, it seems that it's it just it's very typical that this happens that all of a sudden somebody's just coming up with lots of money. The second one is employees not taking vacations. You probably never thought of the person that's hardworking and always wants to you know do their job really well and is very um, reluctant to turn it over to someone else. In Maureen's example, they asked if they could help. And this big, you know, surprise tomorrow and find out how much they got at their raffle or whatever it was, spaghetti dinner. Um, what about somebody who never lets anybody else in to see their work? That is a potential clue right there that something might be going on and something to check. Looks like Carolyn has something. Yeah, my mom worked in banking for many years. She was a... a, a vice president of a branch and they were required to take two weeks vacation together every year because the bank that was one of their safeguards wow. but if you you in the bank were doing something that you shouldn't do within two weeks it usually came to light whether it be procedural or taking something so that was part of you know when they were hired they had to take vacation and they had to take two weeks together oh excellent information yeah I'm not sure that every organization, perhaps even here at Church Windows, we could afford to have everybody take two weeks off at once. But, um, yeah, that's, that might be a good policy, especially for a bank. I appreciate that. So the wrap-up here is uh, I think we've, what we've learned is that the impacts of controls on our organization, no one individual should be involved with a transaction from start to finish. We've talked about that a lot. The checks and balances that we have. Perceived detection. This was one that I'm not sure maybe we communicated thoroughly, but the example of monitoring the safe, putting in the surveillance, surveillance camera, that's an excellent idea. Um, if people perceive that they're being watched or that someone knows what's going on, someone's looking over the financial statements, etc., that's a, a great way of deterring fraud because a lot of times when I go out training and I visit a church, 
and they'll say, oh, nobody ever really looks at these anyway, and it's kind of discouraging. I mean, <laughs> the employees doing the work or, you know, entering all the information incorrectly, and you have a nice balance sheet, and everything's fine, and no one's really looking at it, so it's it's just kind of too bad from that perspective, and also it does kind of give the person license, ah, no one's watching me, so maybe I can take some money. Education awareness. Um, as we all know, ignorance is no excuse for those in authority. If you are a treasurer or an officer of the church, you know, part of the vestry, whatever term you want to call it, you should be aware of the potentials and, you know, take measures to protect both your staff and yourself from fraud. So awareness is, is a lot of it. Surprise audits. This was one that we had in, as a quiz in our class. Um, signing authorities. Pop in once in a while and ask for a list of payables from your people that are doing that. Or ask to see the check register. If the, honest, if the people are honest, they, they shouldn't mind that. They don't, they don't mind being questioned. They're happy to show you if they know how to get it. If not, they call us at church windows on the tech support line. Um, so that's just a, a good idea. Just just go in sometime when they're doing their work and say, hey, explain to me what you're doing in church windows, or can you show me the last bank reconciliation, and take a look through the checks. We've definitely had people that, you know, they never ever saw the canceled checks, and that's how sometimes these amounts get changed and the payee gets changed on there. Adequate reporting. Know how to read a balance sheet and a treasurer's report. That's our church lingo for an income statement. So make sure that you know that income and expenses should fold into those funds and that should all be looking proper when you look at the records. So we want to make sure that you are up on all of these things and you know what to look for. And again, that ignorance factor, I can't overestimate how sometimes people are taken advantage of because they just don't know. And so if you don't know, you should find out. You should find someone, get a person, you know, that, that can help you with those kinds of things. I don't want to keep you any longer if there's no other questions, and I did kind of want to wrap this up. So uh, in conclusion, I want to thank all the panelists that were with us today. We couldn't have done it without you. Um, all the participants that showed up, you're the ones that made it possible for me to work on this project and get a lot of information. Um, so we just appreciate all of you logging in and joining our webinar today. We hope that this has been helpful, and if you've even gained one tip to take away or a guideline, it's been worth it. So thanks so much for, for being with us. And thank you all for your nice comments. Lots of good information. Love hearing that. Wherever you are, if you're on the West Coast or here on the East Coast, have a good afternoon and evening. And uh, we'll talk to you or see you around on a class online or maybe in person sometimes. Thanks a lot.